Dear friends, good evening. We are delighted to have you all here with us tonight. In this cultural season, Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya introduced a new line of lectures under the title, My Experience, where we'll get to know more about individuals or groups who contributed and enriched the cultural scene here in Kuwait through their passion, dedication, work, and craft. Tonight, we have Claudia Lershoud, who became Kuwait's first female photojournalist at the Arab Times in 1979. She was captivated by a country rich in heritage and traditions. So she began capturing the dramatically changing surroundings on film and in writing. She authored five books on Kuwait and has contributed to countless publications, researching many subjects largely undocumented elsewhere. Serving as an ethnographic consultant for the Nessist Scientific Center, she, was, uh, she procured unusual and rare artifacts and helped produce exhibits depicting vanishing way of life. Claudia will touch on many subjects, including Kuwaiti heritage, natural history, and animal welfare. Before we start, I just would like to remind you to keep your mobile phone on silent, and let's give a, wa a warm welcome to Claudia Lershut. Good evening, salam alaikum. Um, thank you so much for the nice introduction, Naha. And many thanks, uh, Sheikh Hassa, for inviting me to tell my story. And thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Well, 42 years and 45 minutes, I've got a lot to tell you. So here we go. I'll never forget my first day on the job at the Arab Times newspaper in April 1979. I was given a roll of negatives to print, and they were covered in dust and some kind of sticky stuff. Now, I'd been trained in photography at the University of California under the very stringent direction of the director of the California Museum of Photography. So our darkroom was spotless, temperature controlled, all our chemicals precisely measured, and every print we produced had to be of archival quality. And if there was a speck of dust on a negative, we'd reach for our little bottle of Kodak film cleaner and a Q-tip, and we would carefully clean the negative in order to produce an impeccable print. So when I was given this dirty roll of negatives to print at the newspaper, I asked my fellow photographers for the film cleaner, and I was met with totally blank looks. And I thought, well, maybe this is a language problem. So I kind of acted out, you know, dust and cleaning. And finally, one of the other photographers took the roll of film, stretched it out, made a fist, spit on it, and wiped the negatives clean. And it worked. So pretty soon I was doing the same thing. Um, the conditions in the darkroom were really chaotic. There were thick black dusty curtains to block out the light and there was no air conditioning. So in the summer it was like working in a sauna and um, I'd emerge from the darkroom just red faced and soaked in sweat. Um, there were big open developing trays and they always had um, sand and, and sludge in the bottom. So when you're developing negatives by hand, you know, had to be really careful not to have the sand scratch the negatives. And um, during the course of the day, photographers would come in and they would add chemicals at their whim. So little stop bath, little fixer, little developer. Um, in university, before developing a roll of negatives, we would measure the temperature of the developing fluid, and then we would calculate the developing time accordingly. Uh, at the newspaper, there was no thermometer. The photographers would come in and stick their fingers in the chemicals and say, well, that's well, about two and a half, three minutes. But working in the darkroom in the days before digital, 
it was the place where photographers could work some magic um, by manipulating the light coming through the enlarger by various techniques. And even in that chaotic newspaper darkroom, um, there was magic in seeing these images appear in the warm, murky liquid of the developing tray and in bringing them to life in the best quality possible under these challenging conditions. And after working in the Arab Times darkroom, I knew that I could develop and print a roll of film anywhere. Um, so it was in 1979, at the age of 22, that I became the first um, full-time professional female photojournalist. And at that time, at the newspaper, there was only one other um, full-time reporter. That was Keith Wells, a um, very funny, clever British guy. And um, between us, we had to cover everything going on in Kuwait. So that was um, news, business, sports, fashion, features, embassy functions, and all sorts of other events. Um, and my work contract was for seven days a week, any time they needed me. So it was exhausting, but I was so happy to be doing the work that I loved, and even getting paid a little bit for it. Um, so it was, it was wonderful. And as Maha mentioned, you know, I found myself in this country that was so rich in heritage and traditions, but at the same time, it was undergoing this sensational period of change. Uh, so I really did feel compelled, you know, to cap capture as much as I could of what was going on ar around me on film and in words. So the tools of my trade were um, a big uh, Mamiya M645 medium format camera with 15 exposure roll film, and later on a 35 millimeter um, Canon AE-1, and um, a very heavy um, cast iron Olivetti manual typewriter that I'd used all through university and I had brought it with me from California to Kuwait. And it was so heavy that uh, when I used to arrive at the Arab Times carrying it, there was a very kind old gentleman who would come rushing out of the um, printing press machine room and who insisted on carrying it up to my desk on the second floor, claiming that if I continued to carry it myself, I was going to end up with one arm longer than the other. Um, so that summer um, in Kuwait, I was kept very busy uh, covering the summer festival. I don't know if you know that Kuwait used to have a summer festival. Um, and let me get some pictures up here. I was assured that I cannot mess this up. I have poison fingers when it comes to technology. Um, the uh, summer festival kicked off with an international opening ceremony, and there were free events and performances by the likes of um, the Bolshoi Ballet and the um, Karakala dance troupe from Lebanon. This is a performance of the Black Tents by Karakala. And this is Saleh Shahab, an official at the Ministry of Information. And, um, He's with members of the uh, Bolshoi Ballet, and he was the driving force behind this summer festival, which really um, brightened up the summer for residents of Kuwait. So in those days, of course, there was no internet, and um, to prepare for an interview, you couldn't just Google your subject. Um, the only English language library was at the British Council, where there was a set of old encyclopedias and some other outdated books. So as a result, the information gathering process was done with mainly first-hand sources by asking questions and observing. And I also built up my own library of books and um, newspaper and magazine clippings of interesting subjects. Finding interview locations was another story. No Google Maps in those days. There were only a few street signs and they were in Arabic. And you were lucky if someone could draw you a rough map with landmarks such as the Marble Palace, the Green Hill, the smashed red Trans Am on the corner. And 
this is a map that was drawn to illustrate an article that was written by my colleague Keith Wells. Um, the article was about how to get to a dinner party using one of these maps. And the artist who drew it was a young Australian artist named Peter McMahon, who was, who was very talented and who could kind of just get the essence of, of things going on in Kuwait in a very funny way. So when going on assignment, I'd leave about an hour before my interview and drive around getting lost and asking for directions. And often would, people would have no clue you know, what I was talking about and they'd send me off in the wrong direction. But eventually I'd get to my destination. And as a result, I soon knew every corner of Kuwait. Navigating the roadworks was another problem. Sometimes new roads would just end without warning. Landmarks would disappear. Uh, sometimes I'd drive to work in the morning only to find an entire neighborhood of traditional mud brick houses had been bulldozed by the time I was on my way home. The destruction of so much of old Kuwait was swift and often brutal. Um, these photographs that I'm going to show you now show traditional Kuwaiti homes that once stood in the area behind, behind Dame Violet Dixon's house in Shark. They were designated to be part of a heritage village, but they fell into such a state of disrepair that they were eventually demolished with the intention of rebuilding them, but this hasn't happened yet. Um, you can see some of the beautiful characteristics of this very simple traditional architecture. Um, the, the wind tower, um, the roshenas, which are these alcoves, and that would have been actually an, in, an interior wall where, um, where that car is parked. And the sidra tree, um, a, a characteristic of just about every courtyard house in, in old Kuwait, it served as the focal point for the family. It was the gathering place. It provided shade, provided knar, fruit in uh, season. It had medicinal uses. And sometimes you'll see in the city open patches of land where um, the houses have been demolished and the only thing left standing will be a lone uh, sidra tree that was once um, the center of, of family life in the old days. While taking these pictures, I met two men who had grown up in this neighborhood. They'd heard that the old houses were going to be destroyed or knocked down, so they had come to say goodbye to their childhood homes. This was quite a, a large um, traditional house. And if you look at the beauty of, of this old door, um, actually, in those days, there was a lady from New York, and um, she went round to all these houses that were being demolished, and she would get these doors either for free or for just a few dinars, and she shipped them to her gallery in Manhattan, where she turned them into coffee tables and room divisors and actually made a killing on these beautiful old doors. Um, I want to thank Dr. Hindal Awadi for professionally scanning the original negatives of these photos. Um, I'll tell you about a project that we're doing later. Um, you'll see that some of the pictures are not such good quality because I've just, I didn't have the um, originals um, available, so I've just uh, scanned them with the cam scanner in my phone. Well, lots of interesting people passed through Kuwait back in those days. Um, here you have Anthony Quinn, and um, the gentleman on the left of the picture with the pipe is the director, Mustafa Akkad. They were here to, pr to um, promote the new movie, Omar Mukhtar, Lion of the Desert. And Anthony Quinn was a, a very modest person. He told me he'd worked as a fruit picker in my hometown of Riverside, California, um, picking oranges before he made it big in Hollywood. Here we have... Um, Mr. J.W. Marriott, Jr. His father had begun the international Marriott business empire by opening a nine-seat soft drink stand in 1927. And Mr. Marriott, Jr. got round the exorbitant price of real estate in Kuwait by using an old ocean liner belonging to the Marriott company for his new hotel. And it used to be docked next to Shoeik Port. And it was quite um, a popular venue um, it was burned during the Iraqi occupation and eventually dismantled and sold as scrap metal. 
1982, Charles Conrad visited. He had been commander of Apollo 12, the second manned mission to the moon, and he'd spent eight hours walking on the lunar surface. When he came to Kuwait, he'd long been retired from the space program, and he was working for McDonnell Douglas Corporation, promoting the new Super 80 jetliner. I was so excited to meet someone who'd walked on the moon, and I was hoping that I'd have just a few minutes to ask him a few questions. And at the press conference at the airport, I realized that nobody else knew who he was. So we, we went up on this 50-minute demonstration flight circling around um, Kuwait airspace, and I got to sit next to him and have an exclusive interview that turned into a cover story. And um, it was published in Arab Times Friday, which was a um, color supplement that used to come out with the newspaper on the, on the weekends. So um, I asked Charles Conrad about what his emotions were when he was exploring the lunar surface. And um, for someone who had walked on the moon, he was very down to earth. And I'll quote him. He said, of course, it was a super exciting thing to do. But for the seven previous years, I'd been eating, sleeping, and breathing moon. So in the end, it just seemed like the logical place to go. In 1981, I was sent on assignment to Cairo to photograph the meeting between the Arab Times editor and President Anwar Sadat. But then the meeting was unexpectedly canceled. So I asked if I could stay a few more days and try to get an interview with Mrs. Jihan Sadat. So the editor said, OK, you've got two days to make it happen. But I'd already set the wheels in motion before leaving Kuwait. I knew the uh, Egyptian ambassador to Kuwait and his wife. And um, I had told them that I'd be going to Cairo and that I'd love to interview Mrs. Sadat. So they arranged the interview for me. And um, I went off to the palace. It was just near my hotel, so I just walked over. And when I got there, I was told I'd have 15 minutes maximum with Mrs. Sadat. But she was very relaxed. She was babysitting her grandchildren that day. And the interview went on for nearly an hour. And then it also was translated, uh, the interview was translated into Arabic. And it was published in our sister um, newspaper, Siasa. Well, that night in the hotel where I was staying, there was a very fancy wedding that was attended by all of Cairo's high society. And when they heard there was a journalist from Kuwait staying in the hotel, I was invited to attend. Najwa Fuad, one of Egypt's most famous belly dancers, was performing, and I had an exclusive and fascinating interview with her. There were many Egyptian film stars at the wedding, but at the time, I knew nothing about the Arab film industry. And I didn't recognize any of them, except for the very famous Lebanese actress and singer, Sabah. And she could see that I wanted to take her picture. And people kept coming in front of us and, and getting in the way. So she made this very grand flourish and swept them out of the way and posed for me. Obviously, a true diva. Well, when I came to Kuwait, there was hardly any information on Kuwait for foreigners to read. So my colleague Keith Wells and I began working on a book. He wrote the text, I took the photographs, and we called it Kuwait, A Personal View. It was published in 1988. And I'll show you a few pictures. Um, this was from a Bedouin festival at uh, Sadu House, also at the Bedouin festival. Um, oops. This was in uh, Mbarakia Market, one of my favorite places in the world. And then, of course, I also had to include modern images. So here we've got early 80s um, Kuwait moving into the computer age. And we've got the Council of Ministers building um, with the silhouette of the Sif Palace uh, clock tower in the background. It's a beautiful complex of buildings that was um, designed by the very famous um, husband and wife uh, team of architects from Finland, the Pietilas. And I got to meet Mrs. Pietila when she came to inspect the site. Well, a couple years later, the publisher asked me to update the book. Keith had left Kuwait, and I began writing the text and taking the pictures. And I'd also been commissioned to write a book about Kuwait's seafaring heritage by the late Hussein Marafi, owner of the Radisson Sass Hotel. He came from a long line of ship owners, and he did so much to preserve Kuwait's maritime heritage, as did his close friend, Dr. Yagub al-Hijji, who I've also interviewed on many occasions. 
Mr. Monafi introduced me to a host of former pearl divers, sailors, sea captains, and shipbuilders, and it was an honor to interview them and learn about a way of life that had been going on practically unchanged for centuries and had quite recently vanished. I spent hours in the shipyard of Haji Ali in Doha on the northern shores of Kuwait Bay. Haji Ali Abdul Rasul was Kuwait's last great master shipbuilder. He built ships in the time-honored way with simple hand tools that served the purpose well for centuries. Here's a picture of him uh, with Mr. Marafi. And when he passed away in 1995, Kuwait lost a national treasure. His story and the stories of other great seafaring men are in my book, Kuwait's Age of Sail. During my research for this book, I often went to the Diwaniyat al Ghalalif, the shipbuilder's Diwaniyat near Sukhshark. My parents lived in Kuwait for many years, and I used to take my father along on these visits, and the visits to Haji Ali and all the other mariners, because my father loved the sea, and he loved to sail. We used to sail together in California, and he'd built his own sailboat, so he was very knowledgeable, and he was very interested in the work of the Kuwaiti shipbuilders, and they really appreciated his interest. And my father helped me understand the technical aspects of sailing, and this was very useful to me when I was writing my book. Well, in 1989, while researching Kuwait's Age of Sail, I was given a photocopy of the book Sons of Sinbad by the famous Australian sea captain and adventurer Alan Villiers. Since then, there's been a reprinting of his book, but back then it was very rare, so that photocopy was a great treasure. I'd never heard of Alan Villiers at the time, but my father told me he'd read all of Villiers' great books on seafaring. In Sons of Sinbad, Villiers' vivid descriptions bring to life his journey on a Kuwaiti sailing dhow in 1938 from East Africa to Kuwait, and it shed light on the work of those seafarers' descendants. I could never have imagined that 30 years later, in 2019, I would have the honor of taking Alan Villiers' son, Christopher, or Kit as he likes to be called, to the shipbuilder's diwaniya. Kit Villiers was in Kuwait for the opening of an exhibition of his father's photographs, as many of you know, at Dar al Athar al Islamiyah's Amerikani Cultural Center. And I'm sure many of you enjoyed that beautiful exhibition. Um, I'd arranged a meeting for him in the shipbuilder's diwaniya with the descendants of the sea captain and the ship's marine carpenter with whom his father had sailed. And here you see Kit Villiers, seated next to Abdulaziz al Ghalaf, son of the ship's marine carpenter, Khalil bin Rashid al Ghalaf, who sailed with Alan Villiers. And standing and demonstrating the use of the bow drill, which is a tool that dates back to the Bronze Age and is mentioned in the writings of Homer, is the workshop manager, uh, Sadiq al Ghalaf. And standing next to him is the marine carpenter, Mohammed al Ghalaf. Here they are in the workshop. And um, this is uh, Abdulaziz al Ghalaf. Uh, oh, okay, next picture. Abdulaziz al Ghalaf once again. And um, with um, Dr. Arad Nasser al Nejdi, who is the grandson of the sea captain Ali al Nejdi, on whose boom Alan Villiers had sailed. Well, as Kit and the men in the Diwaniya shared old family photographs and memories, there were many poignant moments. The shipbuilders gave Kit a handmade model of a boom, the type of ship on which his father had sailed, and he said he would treasure it always. So things had really come full circle for Kit Villiers. For me, I only wished that my father could have been with us that day. He passed away in 2015, and he's buried in Kuwait, as is my mother who died two years later. And the Kuwaiti shipbuilders still remember my father, and they'd even ask about him on that day when I brought Kit to the Diwaniya. But now, let me go back to the summer of 1990. I was in Kuwait planning on having a nice, quiet, productive summer, getting my two books ready for publication, Kuwait's Age of Sail, and the update of Kuwait, A Personal View. Then on August 2nd, uh, the Iraqi army invaded, and our existence became a living nightmare. There are so many stories to tell from those dark days, but no time to tell them now. So I'll fast forward to six weeks after the invasion when my two young sons and I reached safety in America. I immediately began doing television, radio, and newspaper interviews, and dozens and dozens of talks for schools, universities, women's groups, and civic organizations. Kuwait was cut off from the rest of the world at that time, 
and I'd promised my family and friends here that when I got out, I'd let people know about the dire situation in Iraqi-occupied Kuwait. My boys and I eventually ended up in my hometown of Riverside, California, so I joined the Kuwait American Friendship Council in nearby Los Angeles, writing press releases, organizing marches, press conferences, and other events. I adopted the pseudonym Charlotte Smith in order to protect the identity of my Kuwaiti family still in Kuwait, as we had been advised to do by the State Department. From answering countless questions about Kuwait during those long months, I got lots of ideas on what kind of information to include in my books when I got back to Kuwait. So as soon as I returned home after the liberation, I began collecting information and taking pictures of the destruction, the minefields, the places that had been looted. Here's the old souk in Marakia. Uh, so much of it had been burned. Here is Entertainment City. You can see a before and after picture where um, most of the rides had been disassembled and um, put into trucks and taken to Iraq. Um, I photographed the burning oil wells in the desert. My husband and I went out to Burgan Field, escorted by Kuwait Oil Company officials. The massive oil fires burned with a roaring noise that sounded like powerful jet engines. And it was actually quite mesmerizing to watch these huge towers of flame that had a hypnotic, horrifying beauty. This is one of um, 361 purpose-built water lagoons with brackish water to serve the firefighting efforts. And this is a picture um, from my book. And just to show you the scale of the fires, if you can see how tiny the people are. During our photo shoot, the KOC officials kept a sharp eye on the wind, and when it changed direction and began to blow our way, we quickly jumped into the car and drove off to a safe distance. So my book, that should have been an update on Kuwait, A Personal View, became Kuwait Before and After the Storm, of course referring to Operation Desert Storm, the military campaign to free Kuwait from Iraqi rule. Included in the book are pictures from the celebrations from the last oil fire, that was ceremoniously extinguished by His Highness the Emir Sheikh Jabr on November 6, 1991. And in a few days, it's actually going to be the 30th anniversary of that event. Experts had predicted it would take between two to five years to quench the flames. But with the efforts of Kuwaiti firefighters and specialized teams from around the world, the job was done in just eight months. My next book was Kuwait Kaleidoscope. And it describes heritage and traditions and includes a collection of topics ranging from archaeology, old Kuwaiti architecture, mosques and museums, to camel racing, souks, and other places of interest. Um, there's a chapter on Gawa Arabiya, Arabian coffee, and all the traditions that go with making it and serving it. Um, here's a, a mosque that's, I think, is a really beautiful example of modern architecture in Ras Salmiya. And, um, of course, the Friday market, which is a, a popular place. Um, people always used to complain that there's nothing to do in Kuwait. So I wanted to show people that Kuwait has many attractions, but perhaps they're not always so obvious. I've actually never had a problem finding lots of interesting things to do here, including attending the events of Dar al Dar al um, Since the lecture series began 26 years ago, I've had the pleasure of covering many of the wonderful talks for the newspaper, including some fascinating lectures by Sheikh Hassa. One of them that I remember really well was about the three inscribed Mughal emeralds that were part of the al Sabah collection until the Iraqi occupation when they were taken to Baghdad, along with all the contents of the Kuwait National Museum. And as you know, the museum premises were then set alight. And although many items were eventually returned under the auspices of the United Nations, um, many of them badly damaged, as far as I know, the emeralds were never seen again. Um, after Kuwait Kaleidoscope came my book, Dame Violet Dixon, Um Saud's Fascinating Life in Kuwait from 1929 to 1990. It was published in 1997 with an Arabic translation in 2002 and an updated English edition in 2007. For those of you who are not familiar with Dame Violet, 
She came to Kuwait as the wife of the British political agent to Kuwait, Colonel Harold Dixon, and lived on here as a widow after he passed away. I visited her on numerous occasions, and some of the pictures that I took during those visits were used by the National Council for Culture, Arts, and Letters to recreate the interior of Dixon House when they restored it. I have to thank Sheikha Hassa for bringing my book on Dame Violet into existence. After the liberation of Kuwait, there were many rumors about what had happened to Dame Violet. So I started investigating, and I wrote a series of articles for the Arab Times. Sheikh Hassa read the articles and told me that if I wanted to expand my research and turn it into a book, she'd give me access to a precious collection of historical black and white photographs that had been entrusted to her by Saud and Zahra Dixon, the son and daughter of Dame Violet. And they'd given these pictures to Sheikh Hassa because her mother had been such a dear friend of Dame Violet and they knew she'd take good care of the collection. So I began sorting through the old photographs. Many of them had captions written on the back, written in pencil in the neat, tiny handwriting of Colonel Dixon himself. His simple descriptions brought another world to life. These pictures, for example, showing armed Bedouin horsemen were particularly thought-provoking. One was captioned, Bedouin raiders halt at the Dixon's tent for refreshments. In those days, the strict Bedouin code of honor ensured absolute safety for women, children, and non-combatants. Camels and livestock were fair game as the spoils of war, but the animals were never harmed. The world has certainly changed since the days when raiders would politely pause for a pick-me-up at a stranger's tent in the Kuwait desert. While researching my book, I visited Saud Dixon at his home in the UK, and he gave me so much valuable information. He passed away in 2005. Dame Violet's daughter, Zara Freeth, came to Kuwait a couple of times in the 90s with her daughter, Penny, and I got to spend a lot of time with them. On one of Zara's visits, I went through Dixon House with her, and I recorded all her childhood memories of growing up there, room by room. And as a result, I can give a very good tour of Dixon House, which I sometimes do for groups. And Zara passed away in 2015, and that's her with Dr. Yagub al Hiji in Dixon House. In February 2020, just before COVID-19 shut things down, Penny came to Kuwait with her brother Stephen and his grown-up son and daughter, Richard and Lizzie. I spent several memorable, day, memorable days taking them around Kuwait. They were so interested in everything, and they were really impressed with how modern Kuwait is. But they most enjoyed the old souk, and here we've got Stephen trying on a besht. Um, they had to give him the, the longest one in the shop. And he was so happy to drink um, Arabic coffee. He was so happy to see that that um, tradition was still alive because his, his um, grandmother always used to love drinking Arabic coffee. And they also loved going out to the desert where we had a wonderful picnic. Now Richard now has a little girl named Zahra, named after his grandmother. So the family's visit was another occasion when I felt that things had really come full circle. Not long after my book on Dame Violet was published, I got a call from the secretary of the British ambassador, and she said Prince Charles would be visiting Kuwait, and they'd like me to have an audience with him to present him with a copy of my book, and could I come to the embassy to learn how to curtsy? So <laughs> there are a couple blurry pictures of that meeting. Um, years later, I met the prince a second time when I was asked by Sheikha Altaf, the patron of Sadu House, the Organization for the Preservation of Bedouin Weaving, to be their official photographer for the prince's visit with his wife Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall. And here you see them signing the guest book. And here they are posing for one of many um, group pictures. The Duchess was very friendly, and although she was smiling, I could see that she was tired and her feet were killing her. So she was happy when I offered her a chair next to Um Turki, who was seated in front of her weaving loom on the floor. Now in all the commotion, no one was really paying any attention to Um Turki, who is a very important person. So I introduced her to the Duchess, explaining that Um Turki is one of Kuwait's last master Bedouin weavers. I'd gotten to know her through working with her on some ethnographic projects for the Scientific Center. 
So the Duchess asked Um Turki lots of questions, and I translated the conversation between them. And that's a picture of Um Turki and, and I on that morning. Well, another exciting photographic assignment was back in 1993, when I was one of just a few photographers at the American Embassy, when President George Bush and his entourage arrived in Kuwait in a cloud of euphoria in the wake of the liberation. No idea what I'm pointing at, but um, there were Secret Service agents everywhere, and they mapped out the exact route that the president was to take. But when he arrived, he took one look at all his adoring fans. He ignored the Secret Service and plunged right into the heart of the crowd. And these are some of the pictures that I took that day. Everyone was so happy, except the Secret Service agents, who looked very nervous. It was later revealed that there had been a plot by Saddam Hussein to assassinate the president during his visit. And here he is, of course, with Mrs. Bush and one of the Secret Service agents, so obvious, right? With the suit and the shades. Um, my last book about Kuwait came about quite unexpectedly. Um, in the winter and spring seasons of the years 1999 and 2000, my husband and I had a desert camp up north in Sabia, about five kilometers off the road in a lovely, peaceful wadi. We used to have friends camp with us, including an American couple, Beverly Bridgers and John Cobb. Longtime members of the Dada might remember them because they used to come to every lecture. They were big animal lovers, and John adored the camels that used to wander into our camp. And every year at Christmas time, John used to dress up at Santa Claus for children's parties and events like the American Women's League Holiday Bazaar. So I said, John, I need you to dress up as Santa and I'll take some pictures of you with the camels, and I'll turn it into a Christmas card. So one day we did just that. We had the good fortune to find a small herd of friendly mama camels with their babies up on a hill just behind our camp. And what happened next was magical. The big mama camel put her head on John's shoulder, and it looked like she was whispering in his ear. And then one of the baby camels came, and it looked like he had something important to say to him. So after we finished the photo shoot, I said, John, what did the camel say to you? And he said, they told me we need a clean desert. We don't want people to come and throw trash all over and destroy the plants and make a big mess. And so I said, OK, this is going to be a book, not just a Christmas card. And that's how what the camel said to Santa came into being. I'd been researching and taking lots of photographs of the desert plants and animals, everything from desert beetles. This one is shown on some citrullus gourds, hanval gourds, um, gerbils and small lizards, and also giant bub lizards, wonderful creatures that look like mini dinosaurs. They actually change color as the day goes on and their bodies absorb the heat of the sun until around noontime they end up a bright day glow yellow. All the desert creatures have marvelous adaptations that allow them to survive in their harsh environment but they can't survive all the damage being done by people. The cars and buggies compacting the soil until it's dead land and nothing grows. The hunters that shoot everything that moves. So I gave the desert animals a voice to talk about their problems in a story that can easily be understood by children. And also included in the book are some beautiful line drawings by artist and scientific technical illustrator, Noel Aliagut. I don't know if Noel is here tonight. But um, I gave her some photos to work with, and she produced some beautiful line drawings. I'd love to do an Arabic version of the book someday with a more culturally appropriate main character rather than Santa. Um, if I could find a sponsor, a herd of camels willing to cooperate, and a model who has a great rapport with camels like John did, God bless his soul. My husband and I have always loved camping in the desert. Not the fancy camping in tents near the highway in walking distance of McDonald's, um, but the simple camping in the remote desert. And over the years, I've taken hundreds of pictures of desert flora and fauna. And during years of good rainfall, I've seen amazing spring seasons with carpets of sweet-scented wildflowers. But sadly, over the years, I've also seen the desert and marine environments ravaged and many species become extinct. And this is, you know, building rubble in the desert. 
plastic and styrofoam on the beach. In 2005, we had abundant winter rains, and in spring I photographed many different kinds of wildflowers in the desert behind the chalets down south at Azor. We've got the purple desert iris, the tiny star of Bethlehem flowers that are from the lily family. We have desert poppies, desert hyacinths that are actually parasites whose host is a salt bush, different kinds of desert daisies, Arfaj, the national flower of Kuwait, and many more, including one wildflower that I couldn't identify, but I nevertheless included in an article for the Arab Times. The weekend after the article was published, I was out walking in the same part of the desert, and I saw a group of people with big cameras walking around, looking down at the ground. So I went over to them, and I recognized Linda Shaib. I'm sure some of you knew her. She wrote and took pictures for a book on Kuwait's wildflowers. She's since passed away. That day, she was with some Kuwait University staff, and she told me they were searching for one particular wildflower that was thought to have been extinct until they saw my picture of it in the newspaper. And it was that one flower that I couldn't identify. Linda told me it's called Enaldique, or the rooster's eye, Adonis dentatum in Latin. I led the group to a patch of the flowers, but then I had to leave, so I don't know if they were able to take any seeds, but I hope they did. The following year, I kept going back to the same spot, hoping I'd see Enaldik in bloom again. But then on National Day weekend in February, some day campers came and they pitched a tent exactly on the spot where the flowers had bloomed. And Enaldik has never been seen again, as far as I know. There are many people here working really hard to preserve our environment. And I've been able to write about some of them and I've put some Instagrams up for you um, to check out if you're interested. There's Bashar al hunaidi a seasoned environmental activist who goes by Kayak for Kuwait on Instagram, of course, Kuwait dive team, and chief meteorologist Isa Ramadan, who's here tonight, who can be found on Twitter, who's been campaigning for the environment for many years, always armed with the latest scientific information. It's heartening to also see many environmental groups being formed by young Kuwaiti volunteers. They're doing important work to raise awareness, but of course, like the rest of the world, Kuwait needs immediate, wide-ranging, official action to save the environment before it's too late. I also want to mention Dr. Hussein Asayeg, who I've interviewed on several occasions. He rehabilitates injured sea turtles, and he processes and preserves whale skeletons a monumental task and a whole separate story in itself. But I'm so happy that as a photojournalist, I'm able to publicize the efforts of many people in Kuwait in many different fields, too numerous to mention now, but who are working for a worthy cause. Animal welfare is another area in which there's a lot of work to be done. I've been researching and reporting on this subject for many years, and the situation is quite dismal. Um, especially for stray animals in Kuwait. Again, we have volunteer groups that are doing great work, but they're struggling to survive. It's an overwhelming job in all respects, financially, physically, and emotionally. We have no official animal shelter or society for the prevention of cruelty to animals, no accountability for people who abandon and abuse animals, and studies around the world have proven without a doubt that cruelty to animals develops into violence against people. It's also very unfortunate the most widespread method of stray animal population control in Kuwait is poisoning, which causes a slow, painful death, and it's indiscriminate, so it also harms wildlife. I help support Touch of Hope Kuwait Animal Shelter that's run by a lady named Marlene, who's doing incredible work under extremely challenging circumstances. Um, she wanted to come tonight, but she called me. She was out rescuing a puppy in the desert. I wasn't surprised. Um, the proceeds from the sale of all my books go to help pay for vet bills for some of the hundreds of rescued animals in her care. And if you'd like to help in any way, or if you're interested in animal welfare, uh, my email's on the screen. I'm going to briefly go back to the business of writing books, because besides writing my own books, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with some wonderful authors, like W. Nathaniel Howell, the former American ambassador to Kuwait from 1987 to 1990. Ambassador Howell was here when Iraqi forces invaded, 
and will long be remembered for defying their orders and keeping the embassy open and running. I'd kept in touch with Ambassador Howell and his wife Margie over the years, and the last time I saw them was in June 2011, when Ambassador Howell gave a lecture for Dar al Athar al Islamiyah at Al Amrikani that was titled Strangers When We Met A Century of American Community in Kuwait. And you can see him here after uh, giving that lecture with some of the members of the audience. Well, after that, I began collaborating with him on his book with the same title as his lecture. The book traces the American presence in Kuwait from the time of the American missionary doctors. And as Ambassador Howell pointed out, those early missionary doctors forged stronger and more lasting bonds between peoples than any politicians or governments could ever hope to create. My role in Ambassador Howell's book came mainly with taking up the narrative after he'd left Kuwait in December 1990, continuing through the recovery period after the liberation, then with events on the ground in Kuwait during the second Gulf War in 2003, and finally with snapshots of some segments of the American community a hundred years after the arrival of the first missionary doctors. Ambassador Howell's book was published in 2016. He passed away last December, Allah I wanted to tell you about my work as an ethnographic consultant when I acquired artifacts and I helped create exhibits on Bedouin heritage and other subjects for the scientific center, but we're running out of time. I'd like to conclude by telling you about my current works in progress, which I'm very excited about. I'd like to thank Dr. Hindal Awadi, who's here tonight, who obtained a grant from the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture in Beirut to digitize some of my photographic work from 1979 to 1999. I so appreciate Dr. Hind's efforts. I'd long been contemplating the need to digitize the thousands of slides and negatives stored in boxes in my basement, but the job was just too overwhelming to tackle on my own. We'll be holding an, an exhibition of some of those images um, in 2022. But that's not all. I finally started a public Instagram about my work in photojournalism at the long-standing urging of my close friend, Haifa Bejani, and she's here tonight. And she said to me, Um Talal, you have been working here for so long, writing articles and books and taking photographs, and Kuwaitis still don't know about your work. You have got to use social media and connect with people. And she was right. Since I started my Instagram, I've been getting great feedback from lots of people, especially young Kuwaitis, which is wonderful. At this point, I need to quickly thank my husband, my two sons, and my daughter-in-law for always coming to my rescue when I'm having one of my frequent battles with technology, whether it's on the computer, the phone, or even the printer. Technology and I are not friends, um, but I'm learning slowly. Um, among those outside Kuwait who are taking an interest in my work is the ACASA Center for Photography at New York University, Abu Dhabi. ACASA explores the histories and contemporary practices of photography in the Arab world from comparative perspectives. It fosters the scholarly study of these histories and practices in dialogue with other photographic cultures and traditions from around the world. So the people from ACASA ask if they could collaborate with me and continue the digitizing of my work where Dr. Hind leaves off. Then they will catalog it and serve as the custodians of the collection, making the images available online for scholars, other researchers, publications, exhibitions, etc. I'll be working with ACASA to create a narrative for all these images through my books, articles, and my memories. I can see this project taking years to complete because ACASA would like to have all of my work right up until the present. So I just pray that God gives me good health and strength to see this project through to completion. I'm so grateful that my photographs and written information have found the perfect home where they'll be cared for in the highest professional standards. So all my color slides, as well as those black and white pictures that I produced in that hot, dusty dark room all those years ago, will be of benefit to others for generations to come. Alhamdulillah. Thank God for everything, and thank you for listening. <laughs>